Hello and welcome to this very exciting edition of The Interval. With me today is the furniture designer, come artist slash sculptor, Chris Lambert. Chris is known for working with a range of space age biopolymers, which he manipulates while still molten, often at extreme temperatures. Using for the force of gravity and pioneering techniques of polymer welding, he creates otherworldly forms and shapes that defy convention and echo the spontaneous and often volatile moments of interstellar creation. Hold on to your hats. Chris Lambert. Thank you so much for uh, being with me here today. Um, I know you're an exceptionally busy dude, so I, I really appreciate you taking the That's time. A pleasure. Um, so I wanted to get started um, with your career trajectory um, and kind of how you found yourself at where you are today. What kind of perpetuated the direction of travel? Um, well, I started off, I think I was 26, 27, and I'd, I'd done various different jobs. I was a, a musician, and um, I decided I wanted to train as a cabinet maker. And I think the, just the idea of working with your hands, being able to create something um, tangible had appealed to me since I was a child, but I had never really um, thought that perhaps it made sense until then um so that that was where it all started i actually trained uh for two two years in cabinetry um but it was very traditional um i mean as you know yourself being a guitar maker and um you kind of end up being perhaps pushed into other areas within that field and for sure. me, I think I, I started to work with materials that were much less traditional, um, quite far away from normal cabinetry and things like that, which then led on to um, more along the sort of sculptural furniture side of things. Um, and that in turn eventually led to sculpture and art and uh, everything that I'm doing now, which is a combination of all those things together. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so where, when you did your, your training, where, where was that? Um, your I original originally cabinet trained, making training? Yeah, I originally trained with a guy uh, named Mark Fish. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, and this was, this was quite a long time ago, so I think he'd only just really started teaching. Um, I know he's, he's doing very well now as a, as a designer and an artist himself. Um, and his course is very well established. Back then it was quite rough around the edges, which I really enjoyed actually. That was kind of made it a bit more um, dynamic. But there was only a small amount of students, I think three or four at any given time in a, in a year period. So I did that and various shorter courses along the way um, to, to study composites and carbon fiber um, welding, uh, casting, bronze casting, which I later got interested in. And so, um, you know, you, you were saying that you've, you kind of started getting into making at kind of age 27. So what, do you remember what kind of sparked that, um, desire for change and to pursue a different life, uh, track? Yeah, I mean, I've always been interested in making since I was a tiny little boy. I've been taking things apart, putting them back together, uh, drawing, painting, sculpting, carving anything. I just, I don't think I ever realized it could be something that you do that seriously. Um, sure. I, obviously, I knew that artists existed and designers and things like that, but I, I'd never really kind of thought it could be me. Um, it was just a conscious decision that I, you know, I can do this. I want to do this. And it's, uh, it's probably the thing I'll be best at. Um, I was also as a musician, um, probably kidding myself <laughs> if I thought that that was going to be, uh, you know, anything serious. So it was giving up that dream and starting a new one really. And so your, your work, um, has kind of, I guess metamorphized uh, metamorphosis is kind of the word that kind of really comes to my mind, especially when you look at the the work that you're doing today. Um, what what 
which hat do you find yourself wearing the most um you know artist or, or designer kind of furniture maker come sculptor when i'm making the shapes i often don't know whether it will be functional or not until the the shape has started to form enough so that i can see the you know the limited functionality or zero functionality or you know this looks like it would be a table to me you know so then it's a table or this looks like it's going on the wall so it's going on the wall um i i've never been a designer in the sense that i can analyze a problem and find a solution in a sort of succinct way that's not me um i'm not good at doing that i kind of just like to to create and then decide what that is when it sort of speaks to me yeah um i guess that was kind of a question that i kind of wanted to come on a, a little bit later but um you know i think uh you know a lot of the uh, major shifts especially in kind of furniture design um have come about as a result of technological advances um you know i always think back to yeah. marcel breuer and his tubular steel um chairs so so for you mm -hmm. it sounds like the the idea and um the material and the process comes first uh and kind of experimenting with that rather than um kind of the other way around would you would you say that was was true uh, it certainly was at the beginning and being process driven for me it's part of um it's part of the sort of dynamic intent behind anything i create it has to have a, a sort of spark to it, it it's mm -hmm. not a gradual thing um i don't build things up with layers or through refinement in the normal sense but um I'm not looking for new processes all the time. It, it's just that one that I happen to use is the one that suits me, so to speak. Um, if I was painting, I'd probably be painting very sort of abstract uh, patterns without thinking too much. And then afterwards, taking a step back and maybe making gradual changes for several weeks, months or years, whatever. And that's the same approach to, to my physical forms, my 3D forms. I, I sort of start with this um, process driven, dynamic, quick, uh, sometimes violent, sometimes spontaneous, but then it, it really does, you know, take a step back from that and think about it. It's, firstly, is it worth carrying on with it? Secondly, if so, what is it? And thirdly, what can it become? And then it's that last question, I think, that leads me to to really develop it into something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's worth saying that um, for me, for people who who aren't perhaps familiar with your work, um, y you are kind of um, creating it in many different. Uh, spheres as you've mentioned you are you know, you are you are a painter you're also a sculptor with your um kind of more sculptural pieces you know where, where are you working which is kind of giving you access to these these materials or how, how is this um this kind of material exploration kind of come about if that makes sense yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I, a material exploration is something that I consciously work with all the time. So I set aside periods of material science, times to just um, days or weeks even at a time to develop new new methods of working with new materials. Um, it, nine times out of ten, it yields terrible results that you have to then, you know, say, well, that was a lot of money wasted, a lot of time wasted, but occasionally you come onto something which you can work with mm -hmm. and it allows you to see things in a new way which is what i'm all about doing and Absolutely. i think in the same way when you they're not putting a new material on a new uh, or, or a new product on a new material it's paint on canvas but they're doing it in a new way which allowed them to see things differently which then led on to something else and I'm taking things which are used in more industrial applications and trying to work with them in a way that I can see something uh, differently with them 
um, mm -hmm. and then try and show that to other people. But the material science side is very important. Being process driven, you know, you don't want to be working with the same thing uh, indefinitely because you'll sure. just lose interest. Yeah. And it's the, that spark that gives you the sort of need to create in the first place. Um, you have to be, con you know, constantly pushing your own um, your own boundaries, really. So let's talk a little bit about process um, and, and um, some of the specific materials that you're working with. Uh, yeah. One of those that I'm really curious about is is the bioorganic polymers. Um, mm -hmm. I know you do a lot of stuff with metals, you know, you're working with, with casting in very, very high temperatures. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could just give us a kind of brief overview of, of kind of where you're at at the moment, the things that you're experimenting with uh, and some of those kind of processes. That would be amazing. So uh, bioorganic polymers, I started working with about, I think, six years ago, very soon after I started uh, down this road altogether. And they were originally developed for use in the medical industry, medical applications. Um, they, they're they used in, internally and in all kinds of um, sort of surgical applications, you know, hip replacements and things like that. Biopolymers are perfect because your body isn't interacting with them harmfully. They're not... Um, yeah, there's no microplastics, there's nothing like this, and they're not developed from petroleum, they're from other products. Right. So for me, the environmental aspect is important. You know, um, if my work ends up in a, in a ditch one day, it's not going to kill whatever's around it, which is right. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the background of what they were originally intended for. They all have different melting points, and they have very varying... Um, states between solid and liquid depending on the polymer that you use uh working with them is difficult because of the heat and because of the force when you're pulling them or manipulating them it's not like clay it's not like uh you know um something malleable that you can just you know shape a bit and then step back and you know move around it a little bit more there's no addition and subtraction it's a it's a completely different approach to um sculpting essentially sure. so uh, for, for me you know i've had to kind of develop my own processes of working with them um i've had various different bits of equipment built that can uh, pull and push them and we've got kilns in the studio for heating them up. I still think there's a long way for me to, to kind of create forms with them for many years onwards before I've exhausted it, you know. I, I, was, um, I was watching, I think it was on your Instagram um, and I think it was uh, like one of your like planet style pieces where you've got the kind yeah. of, the, the kind of almost like extruded uh polymer oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. and and um it looked like you were working it with a, a hot air gun and then and then slowly kind of just you know almost imperceptibly um molding it and sculpting it with your uh thumbs yeah so so basically when you're um when you're putting polymer next to polymer uh you'll probably end up with it being two completely different temperatures um, the the hot air gun is a it's a soldering iron. It's a, so it's a lot hotter than a hot air gun. Well, it's not a lot hotter. It's a lot more concentrated. So if you have polymer next to polymer, um, but you have no bond between them, there's no there's no connection because they were cold. You know, um, sure. they they might be next to each other, but they're not one thing. Yep. So that welding enables you to effectively just turn it back into one. Uh, one piece of polymer rather than separate pieces. So there's um, natural chemical you know, bond. There's a molecular yes, bond. Yes, molecular yeah. bond there's a molecular on. bond then. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's similar to when you've got clay and you're smoothing the line between sure. them, but it's a it's a lot more um, contemporary, I suppose. Yeah. And and is this a is this a process that you've developed yourself, or is uh, I mean I can't think that many people are hand uh, working polymers. Um, right in that way no I, I it's it's something i developed um just through the need to kind of play it's also it does result in getting burnt quite a lot working with materials <laughs> yeah, so a lot of um a lot of me 
trying to work in new ways to avoid getting burnt is, is kind of <laughs> you know a big part of it yeah so um, you're very I've much actually, su- very much suffering for your art suffering badly sometimes I, i've got these gloves um silicon gloves because you cannot work with a polymer with um bare hands it's you know uh, it's, it's 200 degrees flat sometimes mm. Um, but the problem with the silicon gloves is you, you can't buy them without um, texture. Sure. On, you know, because they're originally designed for grip. Yeah. Um, and it just so happens that the ones I've got have all these little hearts, the texture of these little hearts. <laughs> so uh, oftentimes I'm having to find myself filling in thousands of little heart imprints all over my work. Amazing. Um, yeah, I can imagine that that is uh, hugely uh, frustrating, but also very, very whimsical and amusing. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, I've actually just found uh, there's a company now that manufactures smooth silicon gloves, which I've been trying to get for years, um, which is going to make a big difference, I think. the kind of explorations in material science and and the kind of material presenting uh, ideas and possibilities what else are you influenced by or should I say who are you influenced by um, I mean in terms of other artists I I try not to be influenced by art in my own art uh, art is a big part of my life and it influences my my life uh, my emotions, you know, every every aspect of it, but not my work, because I, I'm, I find that it's very easy to get led down someone else's rabbit hole, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and I've kind of come so far down mine already that I really need to just have tunnel vision and ignore whatever else is going on, not ignore it, uh, you know, uh, in terms of absorbing it, but just of course. really consciously try to avoid putting it near my own work um Mm -hmm. and it makes it even better then when you do find other artists that are similar to yourself because it's the the knowledge that you and this other person somewhere else in the world or wherever they are uh, you're you're sharing these ideas completely independently you know it's like that connection between a, a stranger thousands of miles away and you've somehow ended up doing something so similar to them without ever talking about it or knowing them and all the different processes that must have led up to them doing it and you doing it. Do, do you think the, um, do you, did you find, thinking about your, your transition from, from kind of furniture more into the kind of art and sculpture, did you find mm. that, that furniture was con, kind of constraining in that way, that you were kind of limited by what a table is and what a chair is? And, and uh, do you think that that kind of pushed you in the direction of the more kind of sculptural and, uh, and more abstract fields? Yeah, I would say more that the creating furniture represents a different set of challenges which require a different set of skills to overcome. But um, for me, I often find that when there is a piece of furniture and you look, for example, at the underside of a table, and that might be the best bit because Mm. you've got a big flat top covering... Uh, essentially what's underneath it you know so so then you have to create a challenge uh, it's a way to view what's underneath it um whereas in sculpture and art you're you can draw attention to these things without you know worrying about a big flat top covering everything or whatever it is um so i i, I wouldn't say that it it is necessarily you know freedom from constraints creating art but it does allow you, uh, you know, disregarding functionality is a big part of art, really. That's, that's for me, it's, um, there is no purpose to this. It, it is just there, you know, it is whatever you want it to be. Um, you just can't do that with a chair because obviously, you know, it won't work. So um, it, it's, it's perhaps maybe the biggest difference I notice between artists and designers is that mindset. Mm-hmm. 
one of the uh, one of the, th the just going back to furniture for for a second. One of the one of the furniture makers who who just consistently blows my mind um, it is uh, the Irish cabinet maker Joseph Walsh. Yeah, yeah, it blows my mind as well. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I can over the last kind of ten years or so, I've I've kind of seen him as a, a bit of a, a trend setter in so mm. much as he is really um, taking wood to places that I don't think anyone thought we yeah. we could you know the the, the kind of the, the sculptural things and the, the lamination processes that he's kind of really. Mm. Um, developed have kind of taken mm. wood and, and taken what people um, perceive furniture to be to, to whole new levels. Um, are there are there kind of any people in your kind mm. of sphere that, that you see doing doing similar things? Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, uh, actually, Joseph Walsh is one of the first um, inspirations for me as well. Um, he seems to have this uncanny ability to sort of any form that he creates is uh, just pleasing in a way which is hard to explain, you know. It, yeah, um, it, it is very hard to explain because there's so many people that work with lamination, but no one can achieve that balance between material form and functionality as well. Um, and he, you know, he started using resins and uh, granites and marbles, yeah. um, lo local to him as well in Ireland, uh, which is, you know, for me, it's important as well. Working with local materials should be, you know, high on anyone's agenda. I think aside from him, um, there's many sculptural furniture artists that inspire me. Um, Nacho Carbonell, uh, Vincent de Borg, in terms of his metal work, he was casting, um, he cast pieces which are in motion. And for me, that's quite similar to what I'm doing, but in a yeah. different way. Um, he does it, all these forms which are, you know, exploding outwards or upwards or whatever they're doing, but yet they still form the base of a cabinet or a clock or whatever it is, um, you know, he's doing. There's there's a lot of current makers and designers um, which I find um, really interesting. It it really is I think a time where parts of the design industry is perhaps moving forward a lot quicker than parts of the art industry um, in a way which maybe hasn't been seen before. How much of you think? How much of that do you think is is down to kind of te technology and access to technology? Um, you know, I'm instantly mm. thinking about large scale three D printing, for example. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, three D printing is definitely. I, I don't use three D printing at all, actually. Uh, I don't use really any tech other than um, the material side of things. But three uh, D printing revolutionised our industry from a prototyping perspective. Um, if you consider that, for example. Um, bronze foundries and casting foundries can enlarge you know if you can create something small yeah. which is cost effective to do so with 3d printing you can have it scaled up mm -hmm. so a lot of these public commissions big public commissions design pieces art pieces they're now quite simple to create you can have it printed you know after being 3d design yes yeah. you can using 3d scanning you can then have it CNC'd out of large pieces of polystyrene, and then you can have it molded and cast. It just, um, you know, it's just a, a sort of revolution from that perspective. Um, also, oh, the, the, another designer which inspired me a lot uh, is a guy called Yoris Larman. I don't okay. know if you've heard of him. It doesn't ring a bell. Uh, I'll definitely well, check he, it out. Check it out. He, he was a bit of a pioneer of 3D printing and design, um, and he's created the world's first 3D printed bridge. Okay. Um, and it kind That's of prints really itself as it comes yeah, along yeah, the bridge. Yeah, 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 yeah. Insane. Yeah. Um, and people like that, I think, are so important in driving the industry forwards uh, from that perspective. Yeah. Talking about, um, uh, just going back to what you were saying uh, a second ago, talking about movement, 
um, and, and texture and color as kind of three pillars of of um, y your your work. Um, you know, I notice movement, especially, is uh, and kind of suggested movement is a massive part of your work, as far as I can see. Um, and I'm really interested in, you know, for example, something like your RV chairs right um contrasted with something like you know a kinesis piece You've, they both um suggest uh movement in their own ways i'd, I'd just like how important is that suggestion of movement um, in your work and how do you achieve that so how do you aim um, to achieve that it, it, it's it's very important yeah the the, the essence of, of movement is um sorry movement is the essence of all of my work so uh frozen movement or uh expressions of movement or motion or emotion emotion as emotion if that makes sense mm -hmm. um if you if you take a form um somewhere between solid and liquid it can be in so many states, you know, that there's everything from, uh, you know, here to here, and there's almost infinite states in between. It's very um, abstract in that way. And it, your work um, reminds me uh, very much of the work of Donald Judd. Um, mm -hmm. in, you know, formally, it's very different, but it's, it's kind of that idea that you are saying things not only with what is there, but also the things that are missing. You know, it's all, it's though, like yeah. you say, it's those spaces in between that are telling a story and, and it's up to, uh, the observer to, to kind of put that meaning there and, and you're kind of, um, you're offering up suggestions uh through the the material that you're using and mm. its properties and how you've allowed it to to kind of sit um and i think the the best art is is the kind of the art that that asks questions and, and kind of promotes um thought through that suggested movement and the space and, and the color and texture and i i just think it's absolutely fabulous the 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 work that you're doing in that regard Mm. With okay. with with the, um, the 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 kind of the kinesis, I'm just looking. I've got your website up on an, on another oh, okay. screen screen here. Mm -hmm. um, with the kinesis pieces, the kinesis pieces. Mm. That's a really pleasing thing to say in its in itself. Kinesis pieces. Kinesis yeah. pieces. Um, it very much looks like you've got these uh, two, or you you've got like a billet of metal, and you've you've kind of yeah. heated it almost like you've heated it over a flame or something and then literally mm. just pulled and, and twisted it. Is it as mm. simple as that? Or, or perhaps um, if you're able to talk through that process a little bit. The, the process uh, for those pieces is actually quite different depending on the piece. They all look like they're made in the same way, but they're, they're not. Um, I, I usually start with stretching. I will add on the other pieces afterwards and I'll, I'll carve some away or add some more material. It's, it's a process of weeks and months depending on the size of the piece. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but if you look at it and you think it looks like a piece of metal that's been heated and pulled apart, that's exactly what you know, it should look like. So I'm, I'm pleased, you know, that's the effect I'm after. The shapes on the top of the bottom, the relationship between them, um, is is also representative i mean if you take uh, a solid block and a solid block and you you have a sort of tenuous link between them there's all kinds of suggestions in that connection and the way that the uh, material is um connecting them whether it's it's you know being pulled apart or back together or it's loose or it's dripping or it's um it's abstract but it's no, nothing's really abstract. It's, it really is. Uh, the work is so evocative. And when, when, I, when I look at those kinesis pieces, um, I can almost, it's kind of visceral. It's, it's, it's got this vicarious nature to it where I can, in looking at it, I can almost imagine uh, myself manipulating the material. It's got this yeah. kind of very visually tactile nature to it which is just 
to to pull that off and to create that frozen fluidity is is just really impressive and it's one of the things that really um draws me to your work so yeah i really really take my hat i i thank you very much i i really appreciate that and i for me to be able to do that is it's a it's a privilege you know to be playing with uh, essentially fun materials and um getting paid to do so is, is like a dream job you know you're only partly responsible for how the piece will end up looking um mm -hmm. if you're holding a paintbrush or uh, a mallet and a chisel the work is yours at the end of your process there's no denying yeah. it there's you know some people may love it some people may hate it but it's you they're looking at you it's very personal um I'm trying to perhaps take myself out of that equation and give people a look at something which it's almost like it created itself. I don't, I'm the vessel that kind of channels the process, but it's, yeah. it's there on its own. I, I can totally see that. That's a really interesting um, idea. And it's, it kind of leads me into something else I wanted to talk about, which is, um, navigating the art world, um, bridging the, the gap between art and design. Um, how, how do you go about that and how do you navigate put, putting out art into a world where we have, you know, social media, where mm. anyone can say anything, um, art criticism, um, has gone to totally new levels where people can say things without, without recourse as a creative person who expresses themselves outwardly through their artistic medium how do you how do you navigate um that mm. uh, i i think that we, you know when you live in a world where there are so many millions of people working in perhaps undesirable positions um having the privilege to do something like be an artist um it does evoke a certain response from a lot of people. And I think you have to accept that if you have platforms like social media, you're putting yourself out there um, and you don't have to take the criticism, but it, it does mean something. Um, I think with a lot of my work, I find that the more accessible pieces of the sculptures and the wall pieces perhaps are a bit more um, out there uh, and I get those the response I would expect based on that, you know, my preconceived idea of that. So to me, it makes sense. If um, if you're an artist and you post something and it gets destroyed by the general public, I think you should perhaps carry on doing it regardless. But mm -hmm. understand that you know there are people out there that are basically um, you know they're working a lot harder than we are basically for a lot less i mean i can only ever do you know be myself and create work that means something to me but there's a scale there as well so i try and do things which people can connect with rather than push them away um i think that that's kind of important yeah a lot of people who um, listen to this podcast and, and who I interact with on, on social media are um, people who are looking to make a living um, as artists, as makers. Mm -hmm. um, how do you uh, recommend generating opportunities for yourself as an artist? How do you recommend getting your kind of work known and your foot in the door? I, I would suggest basically that um, you hone your craft uh, and get some honest friends. If your friends tell you that everything you do is great, you need some new ones you yeah. know, and keep, keep the old ones as well. But you need some people that will tell you when you're ready. Um, once you've honed your craft, I mean, you know this uh, probably better than me because your process is a very gradual one to get refinement over the years. And mm -hmm when you reach a point that you think okay i'm not the best that i can ever be but i'm good enough to make a point you know my statement um share the work and, and i say share it physically um get it out there so people can interact with it and so they can see it and so they can talk to you because if you put a picture 
uh, of something you've created on social media and people don't like it and you give up, it's like, you know, you've given up for no reason at all. It was, it's Absolutely. Just, you know, you've got to really go out there still. We live in a real world um, yeah. as well as a digital one. And mm -hmm. you've got to... You've got, I mean, I know from personal experience, people interact with my work a hundred times more when they see it than when it's in a picture on Instagram, you know, this big. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, your studio. Um, mm. and, and where you actually work, you're down in mm -hmm. you're down in Brighton on on the south coast. What's your studio space like? Um, do you work with other people? Are you are you working alone? Tell me a little bit about that. Um, I'm yeah, so I'm I'm about half an hour north of Brighton, uh, Haywards Heath area, um, out in the countryside. Um, I'm lucky in that uh, I share this complex with a lot of other interesting people nothing really industrial which really helps you know mm -hmm. in my own space i don't think i could share it i think that my processes are a bit too i'd be i'd be concerned probably from a health and safety perspective for yeah. other people um it's a big space um the only negative thing is that it's on a top floor um it's about three thousand square feet it's got tall ceilings but if you ever want to get something in and out that, that you can't lift up the stairs You've got to forklift it in. Um, it can be a problem, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it yeah. has been a problem. Many Especially times. with the with the kind of things that you're you're building. But so, do you have? Um, do you, you obviously work with a foundry that's that's yeah. not that, that that's kind of external? Yes, I work with two foundries. Yeah, um, one in Wales, which is where I'm originally from, North Wales, um, just outside actually, and. Um, the Castle Fine Arts Foundry, which uh, they're a great team, very good, very sensitive to this kind of work. And then I work with a foundry in Inverness called Black Isle Bronze, uh, which is run by, owned by a chap called Farquhar Leng. And um, yeah. Have you, um, have they, have you had to work with those individual foundries to, to kind of create new methods of, of casting to, to accommodate the kind of work that you're doing? Yes, they're, they're definitely, um, they definitely, the, 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 the post-processing especially, I, I, you know, I don't know how much you know about um, bronze casting, but it's basically the, the metal can be quite imperfect. I think when I was starting out, I had this idea that you get this perfect representation of what you had, um, but due to metal being you know, uh, an imperfect material, bronze especially, you have porosity, you can have um, shrinkage, you can have all kinds of things, which when you have two components going together, um, requires quite a lot of engineering afterwards. So the foundries are, are really patient, they're really good, and they want you to get something which is, you know, a representation of um, quality and, you know, what you originally wanted so um but that's not always 100 percent possible yeah that's such is the the uh, the nature of working with uh with kind of organic materials as, i guess as you know well yourself yeah do you have a sense of what you would be doing if you weren't making and and creating art have you ever considered what you would be doing instead um i i quite like cooking i think i could open a little a little bar somewhere, simple food maybe. I don't know. Um, I certainly I couldn't I couldn't be indoors in an office. Um, I think I'd go insane fairly rapidly. Um, you know, I've I've had various jobs over the years when I was young that I enjoyed. I, I dabbled in being a tree surgeon. I did a little bit of work on TV. Um, I worked for a company. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I worked for a company that removed graffiti. Um, I moved wow. around quite a lot, yeah. Well, it sounds like you're somebody who um, who has, you know, moves and and kind of, you know, the 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 trajectory is is a winding a winding path. So who knows? Perhaps you'll have a a bistro sometime in the future. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily eat there, but yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Well, I've got uh, I've got a couple of uh, kind of oh. slightly left left field questions, and then um, I'll I'll let you you get on with your day. Um, so if we if we were to have a, a dinner party this evening, and you're allowed yeah. to bring one guest, um, they can be uh, living or dead. Um, don't bring them if they're dead, um, or, or uh, that they can be from from works of fiction. Who would you bring and why? Uh, okay, can I can I bring two? You um, go on then. I'll, okay. I'll I'll have to dig out an extra chair, but yeah, we can do two. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. I'd bring Genghis Khan. I think. Oh wow! Yeah, because you know, I I just want to know what drives someone like that. You know, yeah. what, 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 how do you get up every day and do that? How? Sure. And, <laughs> I mean, you know, to to kind of how many children did he have? I don't know, like ten thousand or something ridiculous. Uh, yeah, not ten thousand, but I mean, you know, the guy obviously was some sort of uh, machine when it came to just putting in the hours. Um, or it was plundering and things like that. Maybe not so, um, but it definitely it would be an interesting. Um, an interesting guest, and I think I would pair him with uh, Tintin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow, that is. Uh, yeah. It sounds. This is sounds sounding like some kind of like Lynchian surrealist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, why yeah. why Tintin? Well, Tintin, um, you know, he's again, he's got this insatiable thirst for 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 finding the truth, whatever that is, you know, and he's also um, uncorruptible, and I would love the opportunity to try and corrupt Tintin, I think, I, I think if you could get him to do something, maybe get him drunk, or um, who knows, who knows what's well, possible. I th I think uh, if, if the other guest is Genghis Khan, then you're off to a pretty good start when it comes to corrupting yes. Tintin. Yeah. Yeah, just get in some tequila, and um, you know, I, th I think you'd be you'd be off to a winner. Yeah. Um, what is one book that everyone should read? Mm. Um, oh God, there's so many books that I would possibly recommend. Um, Give us a short list. What are you, what's uh, what's popping to mind? I mean, I think it really depends on where that person is in their life. If you were perhaps like me, a little bit lost in your mid-twenties when I started doing this, I'd recommend uh, a book called um, The Snow Leopard. Um, and that's a book about finding yourself in the midst of uh, disaster, really, which I think is really interesting. Um, I think a book which everyone should have to read um, would be Gombrich's uh, History of the World book, um, Little History right. of Everything book, and his History of Art as well is equally good, but his History of Everything is, I think, it should be uh, an essential read that everyone should have to read. Um, and finally, mm. where where can we see some of your work? Uh, so it's going to be, the next place you can see it will be from the beginning of February until uh, the end of April. It will be in a gallery called the Urs von Unger Gallery in uh, Gustad in Switzerland. Amazing. Have you got any anything in the UK coming up? Uh, anything in the UK coming up? Let's look to later in next year. Yes, there is some stuff coming up, but nothing announced yet, unfortunately. But I will share it with you as soon as I've got dates. Fantastic. Amazing. Yeah. Chris, I could, uh, I could happily chat to you all day and um, <laughs> uh, followed by a, a, an evening with Genghis and Tintin but yeah. I know that uh, I know that you're a busy dude and, and you've, you've got some wonderful things to create so on that note I will uh, I'll say thank you and, and uh, have a great day it's been such a pleasure to, to chat to you well, thanks for having me it's nice to have the opportunity to, uh, to talk well, thanks for putting up with the glitches, and um, I'm sure this is going to make an excellent episode. So, have a great day, dude, and I'll talk excellent. to you soon. Cheers, man. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interval. I really hope you enjoyed my chat with Chris. What an inspiring dude he is. Don't forget that there is an accompanying 
uh, article about this interview over on the blog. It's also on Medium as well. And please, please, please subscribe uh, on YouTube or wherever else you get your podcasts from. And we're also on Facebook and Instagram as well and TikTok too. We've just got it all covered. Everything. See you next week.